Did you bring a Bible this morning? Yes, sir. All right, I'd like you to make your way over to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 6. The last few weeks, I've been dealing with some of the covenant names of God. And I'd really like to continue that today because through these covenant names that we get insight into, really, we get insight into the very nature of God himself, and we see the revelation that the Old Testament saints had of God. They had, they had profound revelation. Uh, they, they knew things about God. And also, in these covenant names, I believe we can draw comfort uh, as we too know God as for instance, we looked at Yahweh Jireh, or as the King James said, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, the God who provides. He provides every need for every one of us. He always provides. He's the faithful God who provides. We, we saw him as Yahweh Rapha, the Lord our healer, God our healer. We saw him as Yahweh Nissi the Lord our banner, and last time, Yahweh Sid Canoe, which is the Lord our righteousness. That's right. The Lord is our righteousness. Praise God. Today we're going to look at Yahweh Shalom, or as King James, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. The Lord our peace. The Lord knows we need peace. We need peace in a troubled world. We need peace in a time of great stress and anxiety. We need peace in a time of national unrest and international unrest. We need peace in a time when more people are on medication for anxieties, depression, uh, than ever before in history. In fact, America, we're the most medicated society on the face of the earth. No one... No one is more medicated than we are. It's too bad that we're not dedicated. Uh, but maybe if we were more dedicated, we wouldn't have to be so medicated. Maybe. But today we're going to look at a passage in Judges chapter 6 that declares God to be. This is one of his covenant names, one of the compound covenant names of God, Yahweh. Shalom, Yahweh Shalom. You'll find this verse in Judges 6 and verse 24 where it says, Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, unto Yahweh, and called it, King James, Jehovah Shalom. And unto this day it's yet in Ophrah of the Abizrites. He called it Jehovah Shalom. The margin reads, God sends peace, or God send peace. It means God our peace, or God is peace. And, and a little bit, just a little bit of the background, if you back up to verse 21, where we read, The angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand. He touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock. And consumed the flesh and, and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace, shalom. That's what he says. Shalom be, to thee, be unto thee. Do not be afraid. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar there, and he called it Jehovah Shalom, Yahweh Shalom. He is our peace. God is our peace. You know, if you look around this troubled world, if you focus on all that's in the news all the time, it's going to steal your peace away. It really will. It'll take your peace away. It's a restless world full of uncertainty, full of danger, full of peril, and you, you will hear things and read things that can really upset your mind and your spirit. But if you'll focus 
on what the Lord says and who the Lord is, you can have this peace because he is the Lord, our peace, so that so that we soar like eagles above it all. You know, we look down at a troubled world, but we're way up here, filled with the peace of the Lord, uh, no matter what's going on in our world. And something's going on right now in everybody's life. There are stresses and tensions and schisms and uh, trials and temptations and battles in the physical realm, the spiritual realm, mental realm, emotional realm, family realm, business realm, stress, anxiety, everybody's trying to deal with the repercussions of a hurricane, people so angry, we need to know Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace, because let me tell you, the world doesn't have it. The world has no peace. There's a passage in the New Testament that speaks of the Lord our peace. It's in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, He is our peace. Speaking of Jesus Christ. He is our peace. See, the Old Testament, He is Yahweh Shalom. New Testament, Jesus Christ, He is Jehovah Shalom. New Testament, He is our peace. Ephesians 2 and verse 14. Who has made both one, that is, he's made both Jew and Gentile one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He broke down the middle wall of partition between us. Do you, I, I want to tell you what that actually refers to, that, that the Lord broke down this middle wall of partition. Because sometimes we read passages like this, we're not even sure what they mean. But you remember... Solomon built the temple. He built an elaborate, magnificent temple that was destroyed 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. The temple was rebuilt under Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah, which we're studying right now in the book of, in the book of Ezra. About 520 B.C., reconstruction began on the, on the temple. And uh, when we get to chapter 6, we'll see when it was completed. So it was rebuilt by the Jews. That temple later fell again into disrepair over the years in the intertestament period, desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian king. And the temple wasn't in all that great a shape just before the time of Christ. But they had a king named Herod. He was called Herod the Great. King Herod lived in the period before Christ, just before Christ. He began rebuilding, rebuilding the second temple. And, and in rebuilding it, he expanded it enormously. It was still called the second temple, but it now became even bigger than the original temple Solomon had built. He spent the king's fortune in rebuilding the temple. It was finished just shortly before the time of Christ. And, and in fact, other modifications still went on throughout the time of Christ. The modifications and expansion was finally finished in 66 A.D. And in 70 A.D., Roman General Titus destroyed it all. It stood finished for four long years. But this new expanded temple, it, it, was, it was different than the others. Herod had employed 18,000 laborers, and they worked virtually around the clock to, put, to expand, to rebuild. And it's still called the second temple, but this temple now had four big courts, four big courtyards. There was an outer courtyard that was called the Court of the Gentiles. Another courtyard behind it called the Court of Women. Another court behind it called the Court of Israel or the Court of Men. And then there was the Courtyard of Priests. So four big courtyards. Gentiles could come to the temple. They could worship. They could buy sacrifices to offer. They could exchange their coins for temple currency that would be acceptable to God. 
But the Gentile, if you were a Gentile, even if you loved the God of Israel and were a worshiper of the God of Israel, you could only go into the court of the Gentiles. There was a barrier separating Gentiles from the Jews. Gentiles, no matter how much you had converted to being a Jew, you were a Gentile. And as a Gentile, you always had a second status when it came to your approach to God in the temple. You could not go into the temple of the, the, the courtyard of the women. You could not go into the courtyard of, certainly couldn't go in the courtyard of the priests, but you couldn't even go into the courtyard of Israel. You stayed in the courtyard of the Gentiles, surrounded by a barrier, with a warning sign in multiple languages that said, if you go beyond this courtyard, you will be killed. One of those signs still hangs today or is on display today in a museum in Istanbul that, that dates all the way back to that time. You do not go out of the court of the Gentiles. You see, you had a secondary status as a Gentile when it came to the worship of the God of Israel. It, uh, this wall of petition that we just cited in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 and verse 14, he has broken down the wall of petition between us and made both one, Jew and Gentile one. This speaks of what Christ did at the cross. There is now no, nothing more dividing us, separating us. Some versions call that wall of petition the wall of hostility. Some call it a wall of hatred. Some versions, that's how they translate it. Williams translates it, the barrier that kept us apart. Another version translated, translated it, the, the barrier that separates us. Now let me read Ephesians 2.14 to you again. He, that is Christ Jesus, is our peace. He's our peace who has made both one, both Jew and Gentile. He's made us one. And how did he do that? He has broken down the middle wall of petition between us. The New King James translates it, he himself is our peace. He himself who has made both one, and he has broken down the middle wall of separation. Amen. You are no longer a second-class citizen when it comes to your relationship to the God of the Bible. Amen. You are a first-class citizen, and, and you are able to enter all the way in Amen. to the spiritual temple, all the way in. And, and let me also remind us, that the partition, that middle wall of partition that separated Jew from Gentile, that's not the only wall that separated in there. You, you want to remember, there was the courtyard of priests, there was a place where the priests ministered, but there was a wall between them and the very presence of God. That great heavy veil that separated them from what's called the holiest or the holy of holies, where originally the mercy seat was, and uh, that's where the high priest would go once a year and sprinkle blood. Nobody else went behind that veil. Nobody went behind that curtain. If you did, well, it was punishable by death. Anybody who dared go back there, even the high priest, he could only go once a year, and he went... With blood. So this was another great wall of separation. That separated even the average Jew from the very presence of God. That veil was 60 feet tall. It was 30 feet wide. And it was the thickness of a hand's breadth, which that's the width of your hand. A hand's breadth, you got a small hand like me, 7 inches, 8 inches. If you're a big man, big hands... We don't know exactly what that measurement was, but it's somewhere in that vicinity. That's a very thick, heavy, ornate veil. One, one ancient record said it took 100 men to move it, the veil. 
Some think that that might have been, you know, that was a rabbinical record. It might be an exaggeration. But let's say that was one great big veil. Well, when Christ died, that veil was ripped in half, which would then provide access for every believer into the very presence of God in heaven. This is what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51. I want to read these verses to you. The Bible says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, now he's on the cross here, he yielded up the spirit, and look, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The veil, 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, a hand's breadth in, in width was ripped from top to bottom, ripped in half. Adam Clark, he was an old 19th century uh, theologian. This is what he said about that renting of the veil. I want to read this to you. He said, the veil, that is, when the veil of the temple was rent, that is the veil which separated the holy place where the priest ministered from the holy of holies into which the high priest only entered. And that, once a year, to make a general atonement for the sins of the people. The rending of the veil was emblematical and pointed out that the separation between Jews and Gentiles was now abolished and that the privilege of the high priest was now communicated to all mankind. All might henceforth have access to the throne of grace through the one great atonement and mediator, the Lord Jesus. This, this is so profound that I'm compelled to keep talking about it. I mean, I, I know I have mentioned this before, and, and yet I don't think I can ever get tired of talking about this because it's so important that it settles into our hearts. Without leaving Judges 6, maybe put a finger there. But I would like for you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews because Hebrews chapter 10 describes this with great clarity. I believe great clarity and I'd like for you to turn there. Hebrews chapter 10 and I just want to read a few verses over here because this tells us exactly what happened when that veil was rent. This, I believe, this passage we're going to read is some of the most comforting verses in the Bible. It explains our privilege as Christians. You're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your privilege. You have been given free access into the very presence of Almighty God. It's, it's an incredible privilege that, that you can never get tired of. Of hearing. Verse 19, Hebrews 10 19, having therefore brethren, brethren, that's all of us, brothers and sisters, not just high priests, not just Jews, having therefore brethren, boldness. This word means liberty, it means free access, it means fearless confidence. We have boldness to enter into the holiest. This is the real sanctuary, the inner sanctuary. This is the holy of holies. You and I have boldness to enter into the holy of holies. How? By our own goodness? By our good works? By our winsome smile? No. By the blood of Jesus. We have this freedom by the blood of Jesus. Only by the blood of Jesus. We have this freedom by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say his flesh. Because just like the veil was torn, Christ's body was torn by death. And 
And that provided for us access. And now having a high priest over the house of God, look at this invitation. Let us draw near. You can draw near with unwavering confidence right into the very presence of Almighty God. You, you can draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near. What a privilege we have. We can draw near. Amen. We can pray. You have as much access to God as any other Christian. There is no Christian on earth, be he preacher, prophet, priest, Whatever they may claim, no other person on earth has more access into the presence of God than you do. Nobody has more access than you do. Let us draw near. Verse 19 says, Having therefore, brethren... Boldness to enter into the holy, the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. You and me, I mean, Gentiles like us, we're not Jews. Well, Linda might be Jewish, but the rest of us. <laughs> this, this entrance into the holy of holies was reserved not only just for Jews. Jews couldn't go in there. Only the tribe of Aaron, oh, they couldn't all go in there. Only the high priest of the tribe of Aaron could go in there once a year. And he didn't go in with boldness. He went in once a year and he went in with fear and trembling. You can believe he, because you know the exacting details of the law, the minuscule details had to be followed exactly and in the precise order, if you did one thing wrong, if he did one thing wrong and went behind that veil, he died. He, he went behind that veil once a year, sprinkling blood for his own sins, for the sins of, of all of Israel. He went in with fear and trembling. But you and I can go in freely. This is what the Bible says. We have free access to the very throne of God in heaven. That's why Jesus told us when you pray, this is how you can pray. Father. We don't have to pray, oh thou distant holy God, somewhere in the universe. You can pray, Father. That's why I really get aggravated when you get these letters from the televangelists that say, I'm going to take your prayer request. You send me your best offering. I'm going to, send your, I'm going to bring your prayer request before God. I'm going to bring it before God. I bring my own prayer request before God. He'll hear my prayer. And if I want others to pray, I'm going to tell you to pray for me. He don't have no more access than I do. He doesn't have no more access than you do. And I don't have to pay you to pray for me. <laughs> Here we go. Every true believer, a true believer on the Lord Jesus Christ, one who has repented of sin, can now come boldly and freely without fear. You can come with confidence into the very holy presence of God. This would have been unthinkable before Calvary, before the cross. How is that possible? It's possible because we are forgiven. If you have repented of your sins and received Christ as your Savior, you are forgiven. And that we must believe. That when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just some of it or most of it or much of it, but all unrighteousness. Now you are clean through the blood of Calvary's cross. 
You are forgiven. You are entirely forgiven. And you have access to the very presence of God no matter what you've done in your past, no matter what your background has been, no matter what kind of a scoundrel you were. You have access to the very throne of God in heaven. God has no second-class citizens. The petitions are gone. Right here in, in Hebrews 10, there's this great little verse in verse 17. Look at that one with me. It says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. No. No matter who you are. No more sacrifices necessary. You are clean by the blood of Jesus. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He will not hold it against us. Do we, do we understand, can we grasp, can we think about this for a moment, the privilege that we have that's been granted us through our faith in Christ? Jesus really did pay it all, you know. He, he paid for this. He granted us this access. It's, it's none of our doing. That we can pray to our Heavenly Father, and he will hear the prayer of his children. Thank you, Lord. He will always hear the prayer of his children. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Williams translates the, the tense, the Greek tense. And this is how he translates it. He continues to say, I will never, never anymore recall their sins. And their deeds of wrong. Very emphatic. I will never, never. It's not that he said it once, but he continues. He's a continuous. I will never, never remember their sins. Your past is done. Your past is buried. Your past is gone. Your sins are forgiven. You are clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is offered to each and every human being who comes to Christ in faith and repentance. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, I believe you died on a cross for me. Lord Jesus, wash me with this blood that washes away every sin. He hears that prayer. He washes away every stain, every sin, every failure, every fault, all guilt, all shame, and makes you new, new and pronounces you forgiven. And what peace that brings. He is our Jehovah Shalom. We have great peace with God and great peace of God. And we can have this Jehovah Shalom because we know Him as Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Our righteousness is in Him and not in ourselves. We go before the Lord clean, not because we're good, not because we're perfect. We're not. We are faulty men and women. We have failed. We have stumbled. We have sinned. We have fallen short, each and every one of us, in word, in thought, in deed. And so we don't go before God and say, Lord, hear me because I'm good. We go before God and say, Oh God, I stand here under the blood of Jesus in the righteousness of Christ. He's the one who declares us righteous. And it's all because of faith in Christ, the single mediator between God and man, the one mediator between God and man, the one who died for us, who shed his blood for us. Consider your privilege, brothers and sisters. Consider your privilege. We can't, I can't hear this enough. I can't hear it enough. I know that we live in a culture in, in this deep south area that's permeated with Catholicism and other superstitious religions that, that declare that we can pray to others to get to Jesus. Because, you know, you're not good enough to go to Jesus yourself. So you can pray to a saint, maybe. Pray to a saint or pray to Mary or pray to uh, maybe one of your deceased ancestors. Uh, because, you know, maybe they can help you out, put in a good word for you. But, but this is what 
Jesus himself said, when you pray, you're a believer, you're a blood-washed believer, you have access to God himself, God Almighty, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sid Kanu, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha. You can pray directly to your Father. Father. Oh, Father. You don't need an intermediary. You have access. You don't need a priest. That's why in the New Testament there is no such thing as a priesthood. There are no priests in the New Testament. You'll read of pastors, shepherds, prophets. You'll read of apostles, evangelists, teachers, but no priests. Because you know what a priest is? A mediator. A priest goes between you and God. You don't need a mediator. You have direct access. What a privilege we have. What a privilege we often neglect. Through the blood of Christ's cross... You go directly into the presence of Almighty God. And if you've fumbled the ball, stumbled in sin, then you, you go back to the blood of the cross. Amen. And you, you simply pray, Oh God, I've sinned. Wash me clean. Wash me again. Pour the blood of Jesus over me, like we sing sometimes. Pour the blood of Jesus over me. We, we ought to be praying that every day, maybe every hour of the day. Pour the blood of Jesus over me. Wash me clean. Because then, after we get clean, we go walk in this world. And it's a dirty world. And that dirt wants to cling to us. What privilege. He is forever our Yahweh Shalom. This is why you and I have peace in this world. A world of trouble and trial and chaos and confusion. All the anger, all the hatred. It doesn't get into our hearts as a believer. We have the peace of Jesus. Y'all still... Got a finger in Judges? Would would you look back over there with me quickly? (laughs) Because we're talking about Yahweh, Shalom. This is the name Gideon proclaimed upon that altar that he made. Jehovah Shalom, our God is forever. Forever. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. You know, I was, I was thinking about a passage over in Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 57. It says, the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. The wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, you know what the sea looks like. All the waves, the ups, the downs, the restless sea sometimes it's referred to as. And And then the next verse says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There is no peace to the wicked. The wicked being the lost. Everybody that's lost is wicked. Because they're... They're lost. They don't know the Lord. They don't know Yahweh Shalom. They have no peace. And they can't find it. They can't find it wherever they look for it. A pill bottle, drugs, sex, booze, multiple relationships. They just, they have no contentment. They always feel like life is passing them by. Just empty vessels. Can't ever be contented or satisfied. There is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. Actually, I I like the way this is translated in one version. 
It, it's Isaiah 57, 21. It says, But I, the Lord, have promised that none who are evil will live in peace. I have promised that none who are evil will live in peace. None of the lost will live in peace. That's my promise, God said. They can't have peace. All they can try to do is stupefy their senses and their emotions. And that's why they turn from one thing to another, one relationship to another, one, one thing, you know, whether it's drugs, alcohol, whatever. They have no peace. They have no peace. In fact, you can't have it because God promised you can't have it. It's only available through the Lord our peace. Amen. Jehovah Shalom. Or as we read here in Judges 6, the Lord sends peace. One road leads to peace, and that, that goes directly through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. The Prince of Peace. So, so here's what's happening with Gideon. Y'all still with me? I, I want to I have you look with me to verse 1, because there are a few things I think we can glean from this passage today. In, in Judges, is that where you are? Judges, uh, verse 1, their time is not completely unlike our own. This was a very dark time in Israel's history. It was before they had kings. Israel was judged by, by judges that were raised up. Uh, the nation, the whole nation was backslidden at this time. They had fallen back into idolatry and the ways of the idolatrous nations, uh, they had compromised themselves with the heathen nations, and uh, as a result, God punished them. And in their punishment, things were very hard. Things were very difficult. Things were very scarce. Food was in short supply. It's worse than what we have. We don't have short supply. You go to the grocery store, there's empty shelves. We're not used to seeing that. But we don't know what short supply really is. We may find out, though. It's possible we, we may find out. And even that shouldn't frighten us if you know Yahweh Shalom, Amen. the Lord our peace, because he's also Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who will provide. So here's, here's Israel's plight, verse 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian, Seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Now, Midian, this is the nation of Midianites. Midian, these, this were, these were descendants of Abraham, believe it or not, through Keturah, his second wife, after, after Sarah died. But they were a nation of Bedouin nomads. These were some rough people. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Let me tell you what the Midianites were like. They were like pirates on camels. That's exactly what they were. They were pirates on camels. Uh, Instead of having ships, you know, let me ask you a question. You've read about pirates, seen movies about pirates. What, what single constructive thing did pirates ever do? They didn't build. They didn't construct. They destroyed and stole and plundered. They murdered and kidnapped. That's what they did. Well, these Midianites were pirates on camels, and they had a multitude of them. They came in hordes so large that, that you couldn't even count them. In fact, they became such a plague that when they descended on Israel, which they did every time there was a harvest, here they came. Because they knew it was harvest time. So here they come in hordes, and they take everything. They leave nothing in their wake. The Bible compares them to locusts. But, but, but let me just continue reading. Look, it says, the Midianites came up, verse 3, and so it was 
When Israel had sown, that is, they planted their fields, they, they, they're waiting for a harvest, that the Midianites came up, and with them the Amalekites and the children of the east. These were all these nomadic tribes of the east, the, these Arabian tribes. Even they came up against them, and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth until you come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, not sheep, not ox, not ass. They took everything. For they came up with their cattle and their tents. And look at this. And they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to improve it. Oh, no, to destroy. That's right. Yeah, this is what pirates do. They destroy. They destroy, they steal, they kill, they rape, they take what they want, they leave nothing in their path. Like a plague of locusts that would come and just devour everything and leave no food for the farmer. So the Midianites came, merciless people, cruel people. They left nothing for Israel, nothing at all. And look at the next verse, verse 6. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. No food. No animals. They took their crops. They took everything. What can you do when things like this are happening in your life? <coughs> well, you can always repent and ask the Lord to forgive you because you know, They'd been doing wrong. But it says here in the latter part of verse 6, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. They're crying out for mercy now. Verse 7 says, It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, here comes the voice of God speaking through the prophet. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you forth out of the house of bondage. You were slaves in Egypt. I brought you out. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you. And I drove them out from before you. I gave you their land. And this is what I said unto you. I am Yahweh, your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Fear not. It means do not reverence the false gods of the Canaanite people. Do not revere them. Do not worship them. Do not burn incense to them. Have nothing to do with the false gods of the Amorites. Do not reverence them. You are not like them. But look what he said. But you have not obeyed my voice. That's the problem. Yeah. People don't want to listen to God. Yeah. They want to do what they want to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. They want to do what they want to do. Yeah. You didn't listen. Amen. And then, verse 11, there came an angel of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is considered a theophany. Theophany, which means an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Amen. We call it a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ. Theophany is Christ appearing in the Old Testament. Amen. So here we have the angel of the Lord. He appears. And notice this. He sat under an oak in Ophrah that pertained to Joash, the Abezerite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Gideon is threshing wheat, but it's not in the threshing floor where you thresh wheat because the Midianites would take it. They'd see him, they'd take it because they watched all of that. You know, remember, they're there in, in great hordes, great numbers, so he can't do anything openly. If you want to have food, you've got to go hide somewhere and, and just try and get enough to survive, which is what Gideon was doing. Notice the latter part of verse 11. To hide it from the Midianites. Yeah. These were pirates, man. They'd take everything. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee. Yahweh is with you. Yahweh is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon may have been hiding, but he really wasn't a coward. He had to hide. He's one man. He's, these Midianites were a scourge. There were tens of thousands of them. So he's, he's hiding just to eat. And, and the angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you. Yahweh is with you. I mean, he uses the Hebrew word for the name of God. Yahweh is with you. He is with you. That, that's very comforting, but it caused Gideon here to raise two questions. Oh, my Lord. Now, he doesn't recognize him right now for who he is. He doesn't recognize the angel of the Lord for who he is. He thinks he's a stranger. He says, here's his question. If the Lord is with us, if Yahweh is with us, then why? Why are we going through this? Why is this happening to us? Why are we so hungry? Why is there never enough? Why, why, if he's with us, why is he allowing these terrible things to happen? You ever been tempted to ask that yourself? Why, why is this going on in my life? Why so much trouble? Why so much trial? Why is this happening in my family? Why is this happening in my workplace? Why? Why am I facing bankruptcy? Why am I, why am I dealing with these things I'm dealing with? It, it could be because you go back to uh, verse 10, have we obeyed the voice of the Lord? Maybe we're going through it because God's chastening us. And if it's not chastening, maybe we're going through it just because the Lord's allowing us to be tried and tested. That's and right. like the Bible says, proven whether we'll serve the Lord or not. Why is this happening? I don't understand it. And not only that, but where be all his miracles? Why? Where? Lord, where's your miracles? If, if this is happening, why is this happening? And, and Lord, where are God's miracles? Some demonstration of God's deliverance, his, his deliverance. We know that, we know, this is what Gideon says, we know God delivered Israel before. Notice, where be his miracles which our fathers told us of? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? He delivered us from Egypt with mighty plagues against Pharaoh. He, he, he did miracles. He, he turned the waters of the Nile red with blood. He, he parted the Red Sea. He did miracles in the past, but now. I, I wrote a circle around that in my Bible. But now, where are your miracles right now? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now God is absent. We don't, we don't see him. We don't sense his presence. I, I think a lot of us ask the same questions sometimes. Why and where? Why, Lord, is this happening? And where are you, Lord? Where's your power? Where's your miracles? Where's your healing? Where's your saving? We've been praying for the salvation of loved ones. Where's, their, where's your saving hand, Lord? Where's your mighty power? Where's your healing hand? We, we're struggling with this situation, with this pain. Or The fact is, I, I think maybe, maybe we could pray the same thing. Lord, where is your power? We want to see a demonstration of your power, your healing power, delivering power, saving power, Holy Ghost power. We need your power, Lord Jesus. We don't need any more empty hype. I'm hyped out with the foolishness. We don't need any more programs. We don't need any more plays. We don't need any more performances by superstars. We need power. We need the power of God. We need to see the power of God show up. We need Jesus to show up in power. We need the Lord to show up and put things right. We need the Lord to show up and put us right. And I do believe that Gideon was desperate. I believe there was a desperation in him. And maybe that's what we need. Maybe we just need we need to be desperate. 
Maybe we need a baptism of holy desperation. Maybe we could pray for that. Lord, 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 baptize us with a holy desperation for more of you in our lives, more of you in our family, more of you in our heart. Lord, we need this baptism of holy desperation. Verse 14, and the Lord, Lord, you see it's all capitals, Yahweh, looked upon him and said, go in this thy might and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? The angel of the Lord tells Gideon he's going to be Israel's deliverer. And he has to think at this point, who are you? Is this a joke? I'm going to save him? Look, verse 15. He said unto him, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. How can I save Israel? First, we're not a prominent family. We're not a political family. We have no clout. We have, we're not prominent people. And second, we po. And besides all of that, in all of my father's household, I'm the least. I'm the least of them. Of, of all my brothers, uncles, cousins, I'm the least of them all. We have no men. We have no money. I have no experience. How am I going to deliver Israel? He's got to be wondering a little bit at this point, who is this? Who is this person talking to me? Uh, who is this visitor? Verse 16, and Yahweh, the Lord, said unto him, surely I will be with thee and you will smite the Midianites as one man. As if there was only one of them. You'll smite them. They will melt in front of you. It's, it's like you're going to have Israel and there'll only be one person. It'll be no contest. Amen. And he tells him here, look, I will be with you. Now, before he told him in verse 12, Yahweh is with you. Yahweh is with you. And he says, I am with you. Now Gideon's, his eyes are opening as to who this, who this person is. He's realizing this this is a supernatural visitor here. And he's talking to an angel. He's having a little trouble understanding and processing all that the angel is telling him. He's got to be wondering, is this for real? Am I dreaming? And then, and then he makes a request. Look with me in verse 17. He said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. I need to know I'm not dreaming. I need to know this is real. And then he, he asked this request, Depart not hence, I pray thee. Don't leave until I come back and bring forth my present. It means my offering. Or I'm going to bring a sacrifice. I'm going to bring a gift. I'm going to set it before you. Don't leave. Please don't leave until I come back. And, and the angel of the Lord said, I will wait until you come back. So, verse 19, Gideon went in. He made ready a kid. This is a, a young goat. And unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket. He put the broth in the pot. He brought it out unto him under the oak. And he presented it. He laid it before him. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock. And pour out the broth, and he did. So it was obviously a big rock day. He put it all on the rock. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand. And he touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Well, he asked for a miracle. Lord, where's your miracles? Where's your power? Well, he just got a demonstration of power. But now he's terrified. Before he was afraid of the Midianites. Now he's terrified. 
he just saw an angel of the Lord who said, first said, Yahweh is with you. And he said, I'm with you. Wait a minute, he's putting two and two together. I'm in, and he says, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble. Why? Notice what he said. He says, when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, I'm dead. <laughs> Basically, that's what he's saying. Alas, O Lord God, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Alas, alas is this expression of, of like doom. I'm doomed. I'm finished. I'm toast. Because I've seen face to face. I've seen the face of the angel of God. Well, you know, there's a passage in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20 where God told Moses and Israel, he said, you cannot see my face. For there shall no man see me and live. No man will see me and live. You, you, we can't look upon the face of total holiness, infinite holiness, infinite purity. We can't look upon the face of infinity. Maybe Gideon's thinking now, you know, I could hide at least from the Midianites, but I can't hide from God. And, and, and now... It's one thing the Midianites want to kill me. Now God wants to kill me. I am in, I, I'm, I'm doomed. But notice, now, now verse 21 had told us that the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. The, the sacrifice was consumed. The angel of the Lord vanished out of his sight. But he was still there. He was just invisible. Right. You don't see him. Like, like we don't see him, but the Lord's here. And notice... Because verse 23 is obviously still there. The Lord said unto him, Shalom, peace. Peace be unto thee. Do not be afraid. You will not die. He was still there. The angel of the Lord still there. And he's always with you even when you don't see him. He's with you. He's still there. And he spoke peace to Gideon's heart. He spoke peace to his fearful heart. He still spoke peace to his anxious heart, just like the Lord speaks peace to us. When you're dealing with anxiety and stress and trouble and worry and fear, he eased Gideon's anguished mind, Shalom be unto thee. Do not be afraid. You will not die, is what he said. You will not die. And then verse 24 and Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. The Lord gives peace. The Lord brings peace. The Lord our peace. The Lord my peace. Just like Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the city of peace. So Yahweh Shalom. God is our peace. Christ is our peace. He is our peace who has broken down every wall. He called the altar Jehovah Shalom. And you know the rest of the story. We won't read it the next few chapters, but God dealt with Gideon. He tore up the big false idol, and, and he actually caused the Israelites to rally again, not only behind him, but behind God. And return to the Lord their God in repentance and faith. And as a result, God took only 300 men, 300 men with Gideon, armed with a clay pitcher and a trumpet and torch. That was their armament. And those 300 God used to deliver them from the entire host of the Midianite Amalekite army. That was so big, the Bible describes that they were like grasshoppers on the face of the earth and their camels without number. And yet 300 men shouted the sword of Gideon and the Lord broke the clay pots, raised their torches, and all of the Midianites killed one another. God sent the spirit of confusion among them. And they saw each other as their enemies and they all started killing one another. Hey, he wanted to see a miracle. 
He prayed, Lord, you did it in the past. Lord, where's the miracles? Well, God's still in the miracle business. That's what he showed Gideon, and, and that's what he wants us to know as well. God's still in the miracle business. And when we walk with the Lord in humility and faith, he's always going to make a way for us, a way of deliverance, provision, blessing, healing, salvation, whatever we need. You know, we serve the God who is ever-present. He's always with us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. I wish I could tell you that the end of the story was really great. I mean, it, the Midianites were crushed, and uh, Gideon became a great judge, and he presided and he ruled for 40 years. And during his entire period as judge, Israel was blessed. They were blessed. They were free. They, they had peace amongst themselves. They had peace with God. They had peace. There was no Midianites attacking for 40 years. But then you get to Judges chapter 8, and you read this. It came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made Baal Barith their god. And the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hand of all of their enemies on every side. Yeah, memories can be short. Walk with God, have God's peace. Oppose God, you won't know peace. You will not have it. It's not available. In fact, God promises you, you can't have it. Walk away from God, defy God, abandon God. There is no peace for you. You might try and stupefy yourself. You might try and find peace in a pill or peace in a booze bottle. But there is no peace, says the Lord, to the wicked. He promises, I will not allow them to have peace. But you know what's interesting? I've talked to people who are as lost as could be. And they'll tell you, oh, I, I have peace. I have peace. It, it's a false peace. It's a pseudo satanic peace. It's a peace that they've deceived themselves into thinking that they have. But I would just, I want to just end today with just kind of refreshing our mind. We, we live in a troubled time, a time riddled with anxiety, a time of uncertainty internationally, nationally. We have people in office who make us grit our teeth and uh, we, we have a, uh, not just a nation, but a world that has been under a plague. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is unprecedented, what's yeah. been going on in our world. It's never happened, not only in our lifetimes, it's never happened before. Right. A stinking plague that's killed so many people. We've got uh, the prospect now of inflation. I, 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 I wouldn't doubt if we didn't see double-digit inflation very, very yeah. soon. Totally. There's great instability in the world We've got North Korea firing its rockets, you know, th rattling its saber, but a far, far more serious threat yeah. is China. China, yeah. China yeah. wants Taiwan. Yeah. China, China is, uh, yeah. is definitely uh, a, a, a rising threat to America and the world. The kings of the East, I think the Bible refers to them as. Uh, when you're starting to see the storm clouds gather, we've been having unprecedented weather, That's right. weather events. Uh, uh, you realize there's not a whole lot of peace in this world. You, you're not going to get peace reading the newspaper or watching the, the news, that's for sure. But when we're tempted to be troubled, to be anxious, to be overwhelmed by the situation we're in, I, I have just a, a few quick words for us, and I'm going to quit. Stop and pray. Amen. Just stop and pray. Amen. That's what we do. Stop and pray. Hear my cry, O Lord. Attend to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I cry to Thee when my heart is overwhelmed. I'll look to the rock that's higher than I. Stop. Stop. Cease from all the crazy because, you know, your mind bombarded, all the things going. Stop. And pray, remembering 
you have access to Almighty God. You have access to Yahweh Shalom. You have an invitation. Let us draw near. You can come personally and pray directly to Almighty God, your Father, and He will hear your prayer. Stop and pray. And then, you know, there are these great promises that says, like, be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God. That passes human understanding will fill your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Pray. Pray. Let it, let that prayer go to God. And always, 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 this is, this is my practice. I'm going to repent. I'm going to ask the Lord to wash me, cleanse me. I'm going, to re- I'm going to go back to the blood, the fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins so that sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. I'm going to repent. I'm going to pray. I'm going to repent. Lord, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me, forgive me, wash me, pour the blood of Jesus over me. Very, very simple. Be clean. And then be courageous and go before your God, making your request known unto him. And here's something else I recommend. This is also what I like to do. I like to latch on to a promise. Amen. Whatever it is I'm going through, whatever the, that particular trial, I, I'm just going to latch hold of a promise. I'm going to remind God of that promise. Yes. If it's for a loved one, then you remind the Lord, Lord, you said, me and my house would be saved. Right. Acts 16, 31. I'm holding right. on, Lord. I'm holding on. If it's for healing, you latch on to a healing promise. Lord, by your stripes I am healed. You sent your word and healed them. Lord, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. The Lord will raise them up. We'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You latch on to a promise. You, you latch on if it's a promise, if it's a need, a financial need or any other need. You pray, you repent, you latch on to a promise. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Latch on to the promise. We're told in Peter, whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, whereby are given unto us, not given unto angels or given unto others, But they're given unto us exceeding great and precious promises whereby we may be partakers of the divine nature. You latch on to a promise. They're given unto us. Let's not ignore that great promise. Don't you want them? Don't you need them? Then latch hold. Declare it. Believe it. Talk talk that promise to yourself and talk it to the devil and declare it to God. Lord, I know you're my provider. You are Yahweh, Yahweh, Chira, my provider. You will provide my every need, whatever it is, you will provide it. And don't let this anxiety take over you. And then give God the praise that he, he deserves. Give him the praise he deserves. Just open your mouth, sing, be thankful. You have great privilege. What privilege you have, what privilege you and I have to know our God as Yahweh Shalom. Amen. Second Thessalonians three, I'm gonna close with this, verse sixteen. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always, by all means. The Lord be with you all. Oh, Lord, I pray your great peace upon each and every one of us. Lord, we need your peace. Lord, you know what's going on in each of our lives. The trials, the things we're facing, the struggles, the temptations, the things we're wrestling with, the people we're wrestling with. Lord, our own hearts that we're wrestling with and our own restless minds. Lord Jesus, we need your peace. Come and flood our souls 
O Yahweh Shalom, flood our souls with your great peace. Lord, let us ever remember our privilege. The privilege to come before you with confidence in prayer. Knowing you will hear us, knowing you will receive us, never will you reject us. Let us ever find cleansing under the blood. And let us ever stand in the very righteousness of our God. Bless us as we go. Fill our hearts, our homes, our minds with your peace, our families with your peace. Use us for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God.